Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I, my name is Eleanor Fink, and I, I am the founder of the American Art Collaborative Linked Open Data Initiative. I think it works now. Uh, let me introduce our panel today. I'm going to give you some background about the project after introducing everyone else. Uh, Rob Sanderson, who's the semantic architect of the J. Paul Getty Trust, is going to talk about a de facto standard that grew out of the American Art Collaborative that they will be working on in the next uh, year or so uh, with an international working group to uh, produce a, a um, 1.0 version of linked art uh, as something that you all would be able to use if you're interested in linked open data. And Samantha Norling, from the uh, lab at Newfields. Does it work now? Yeah. Yes. Lab at Newfields. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, some very important next steps for the American Art Collaborative, namely that the Newfields lab, which where Samantha works and her boss, Stuart Alter, who is head of technology and innovation of the Newfields lab, um, will be providing to the broader museum community, namely in services such as modeling and mapping data and hosting data and uh, producing easier to use documentation uh, and, and some other things that she will talk about. And then Liz Neely from the O'Keefe Museum. Uh, O'Keefe was not part of the American Art Collaborative, but the museum has been interested in linked open data and it, it, in a way, it represents what we hope will happen uh, among many of you, namely that you'll embrace linked open data. What's important about Liz's uh, work is that they are using some of the tools that the American Art Collaborative produced, which we hope we will see across the broader museum community. And then Dwayne Degler from Design for Context uh, will talk about some of the value of linked open data and use cases and uh, give some information about the re-granting uh, that will be provided if we are successful in obtaining our next round of fun funding from the Mellon Foundation. Okay, so to begin, uh, I wanted to provide an overview and maybe clarify a few misconceptions. So the American Art Collaborative is a partnership of 14 U.S. institutions, 13 museums and one archive. And it recently uh, published over a quarter million of linked open data records that cut across the collections of those institutions. And that information is available for researchers and students from anywhere in the world. Uh, there are, the images and data remain in the domain of the uh, institutions that provided the data. And this, that's the American Art Collaborative website. I want to underscore the website is really important because a lot of what I will be talking about today in terms of lessons learned and accomplishments, all are available on the website. I can't go into much detail here, so please make note of the uh, URL for the website so that you could go there later. There's a guide there, for example, that includes links to a lot of the open source tools the American Art Collaborative produced that you may find very useful. Um, one of the misconceptions is that when we began, and of course the inspiration for the collaborative was to learn together. Uh, the idea was that the 14 institutions could find out about uh, linked open data, learn about it, and publish their records as linked open data. But we never intended it only to be for American art. It was always intended to be for museums generally. Secondly, it is not a membership organization. Sometimes people come up to me and say, how do I join? And it was always our intent to enable the broader museum community to be able to produce their own linked open data. And that's why some of the things that you're going to hear about from the rest of the panel are so important. <coughs> uh, so I just wanted to mention that up front. These are the uh, museums that uh, form the American Art Collaborative uh, as of now, large and small, as you can see, from different parts of uh, the United States. And our reason for engaging in linked open data are many things, but we were interested in the fact that 
you could provide more knowledge than any single institution by being able to search across the broad content of the collaborative and that it could also open a window to the world of knowledge, especially if you were able to link across domains um, and better precision in searching, what we call the semantic loop. Uh, and in course, as a collaborative platform, it provided uh, an opportunity to perhaps uh, have use cases among curators. We could tell fuller stories about our cultural heritage there certainly would be more visibility for any museum participating, um, and basically we could learn together. And this is just a little diagram. We, it's all about connecting the dots across the collections with other linked open data resources so that you are able to search seamlessly at some point uh, across the linked open data <laughs> community or universe. And it's not just limited to art museums. You're beginning to hear from natural history museums uh, keen interest in linked open data for, for similar reasons. So we began with a planning grant from the Mellon Foundation. We had a leadership grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and an additional Mellon grant that allowed us over the past uh, three years to explore linked open data and, and publish our, our uh, records. That money from the various foundations covered uh, four in-person meetings, advisory committee, the mapping and conversion of the data, a lot of training workshops, and various linked uh, open source tools that we produced that you would be able to use as well. So in essence, I won't go in, into depth, but uh, linked <coughs> open data breaks data down into subject, predicate, and object. You use a W C standard, RBF, to tag information. And what's really important to get the precision in searching is to use an anthology. And in the cultural heritage realm, the CDOC CRM is the leading anthology. That's what we use. But it's huge, and it's very complex. And one of the lessons learned was that it's hard to figure out how to, how to uh, apply it, especially when you're applying it over data that varies a lot from 14 different institutions. And so out of that blue linked art, which the Getty has expanded and will continue to expand, and Rob will be talking about that later on. This is just an illustration of our pipeline. I won't go into this in detail, but I will say that all of this is available on the website in the guide that we published. So you could go back to that and, and study that, and also the uh, lab at Newfields, which is taking the baton in the next iteration of the American <coughs> Art Collaborative under grant funding, will be working on that platform. Um, so there are lessons learned. This is an article. Again, there's a reference to this on the website that you can access to learn in detail our lessons learned. Just to mention a few, we started off realizing that some of the partners didn't have a digital strategy uh, that included right statements and uh, that some wanted to just get their data converted and not learn how to do it on their own, um, and that it was important to um, have contract services, such as Newfields will be providing, <coughs> by people who understand art, because we had the Information Sciences Institute at USC do the conversion. In the end, it worked, but there were a lot of misunderstandings because these people didn't understand the nuances of art information. Uh, technical expertise among the partners varied considerably. Some of them had trouble extracting their data. There were many data inconsistencies in the information itself. As I mentioned, conflicting views of how to implement the CDOC CRM and the need for a target model. And again, the website that has all of this information. <coughs> What we achieved, well, we produced the target model a significant achievement. Now it's going to become a community initiative through the Getty's leadership. Uh, it helps decipher the CRM. We converted all these objects, which each of the participating institutions are making available through a web page off of their website, but also it's available uh, as a sparkle endpoint at the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute. This is its crop, the Newfields webpage. 
uh, and they make a reference to the good practices and also how to access their data as well as the entire Art Informa uh, American Art Collaborative data set. And they also have a statement here that invites developers to come and use the information and share with us the results. Uh, there were a lot of open source tools, as I said, Karma, which I think Samantha will talk about a bit, perhaps in her presentation. It's used for mapping the data. Um, a mapping validation tool, a link curation tool for linking to the Getty vocabulary. <coughs> Again, all these are all open source tools with the links provided on the website. A IIIF tool. Um, most of the <coughs> participating institutions were keenly interested in using IIIF. Uh, the guide is available on the website. It's 80 pages. It breaks down into different parts, good practices, recommendations, and an FAQ. It provides some linked open data basics. It talks about how we approach the project and the difficulties we encountered. Here you can see at the website under new where you can get this information. Uh, just looking at some of the chapters or sections of the guide, how the CDOC CRM works, target models, triple store and sparkle endpoints, uh, to give you all this background in information. Here at the FAQ, what is an anthology? What are my options for selecting a license? What open source tools are available to map, produce, and review linked open data? What minimum data is needed to begin linked open data? And can I add more in phases? So. The FAQ hopefully will answer a lot of questions you may have about linked open data. And then the good practices <coughs> recommendations uh, about establish your digital image and data policies, choose image and data licenses that are easily understood, all the way down to number 12. In the end, make sure you operationalize your linked open data within your museum. So for the next steps, as I mentioned, uh, the Getty will be setting the de facto standard for using the CDOC CRM, the linked art model, linked art, art model. New fields will be providing services and training, easier to understand documentation, and the uh, AAC applet regrants using AAC data. So thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Rob. <laughs> uh, thank you, Eleanor. Um, and Eleanor has done such a great job of explaining what I'm going to talk about that I can probably just sit down. But um, so the uh, the target model. Well, actually, first, um, thank you everyone for coming uh, because this was a very competitive session, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and who would have thought that at MCM, uh, a traditionally very interpretive um, and uh, front end oriented conference, we have essentially standing room only as a, a data oriented session. So thank you very much. So yeah, as, as Eleanor said, um, as part of the American Arts Collaborative work, um, David Newbury and, uh, and myself, um, uh, David was then at Carnegie Museum of Art, um, finalized at MCN in New Orleans, so two years ago pretty much exactly, um, the target model that we mapped uh, the institution's data to. Uh, it was a very limited input data, you know, relative to all of the data that we as a domain hold, um, the 14 institutions. It was a limited scope. It was artworks and people. Um, it, we came close to being able to come to a target model for the archive, but there was never enough time, uh, which was, of course, the, the third one. It was also a limited time frame uh, in which we had to get stuff done. The things which came out of the target model um, there were three main ones, all of which begin with you. Uh, but um, so, <laughs> use cases. Uh, we made sure that everything uh, was based on actual data and actual user needs. Right? If it was just a case of, well, hypothetically, someone might want to search for such and such, we kicked it to the, uh, to the road. Um, understanding. Uh, also critically important, um, it should be consistent and it should be simple, uh, because if it's not able to be understood by um, researchers and developers, then it won't be used. Uh, and if it's not used, why are we wasting our time doing it? Uh, which is the third U, usability. Uh, it should be developer friendly, because at the end of the day, if a developer can't take the data and produce something useful with it, they won't. 
and the data with us on the way. So why a target model um, uh, within AAC? Uh, the first one, of course, was to enable the, the non-domain specialist uh, computer science students at, at ISI to engage with the mapping process as opposed to the modeling process. So they had data, and we gave them this thing to map it to and how to do that mapping. Um, so they wrote code, whereas we did the, um, the information science part. Uh, the need for consistency across organizations. So if everyone did their own mapping completely independently, um, it would have been very hard to build um, a application on top of it that did anything meaningful. Um, all of the URIs would be different. It would be 14 separate silos in a vaguely related format, but it wouldn't be linked data. It wouldn't be a community. It wouldn't be a collaborative. Um, and finally, as Eleanor mentioned, the standards uh, for description of um, tropical heritage objects using Synapse CRM uh, is complicated. It's a uh, a very theoretical first model, whereas we wanted a use first model. So essentially what we did was define an application profile uh, of if this is your use case, this is how you describe it. So instead of understanding all of the theory, instead you come with your use cases and it says, okay, this is your use case, you need to describe a person, okay, you probably want to know what their birth date is and when they died and where they lived and what they did, and this is how you can describe those things as opposed to, there is a class, it is a person. It can have n number of activities that this person did over their lifespan. Oh, lifespan, no, no, that's not a concept, uh, et cetera. So essentially it was coming up with best practices from a use case driven perspective. A, I won't go into the ontological details, but as a, as a 50,000 foot view, um, objects are not the center of the universe. Uh, instead, it's, it's human activity. Uh, and for folks who attended David Newbury's talk um, a couple of years ago uh, at one of the Ignite sessions around the social network uh, of objects, this is the outcome essentially of, of that. That um, it is the activity that adds value to the objects. The activity is carried out by people. We care where that activity took place. And we care when it took place because it's at the end of the day cultural heritage, not just an object without context. Uh, and of course, once you have that, you can then refine it to say, you know, this activity <laughs> produced an object, or this activity used an object, and this activity destroyed, hopefully not, an object, uh, and so on. Then for the last couple of years uh, at, the, at the Getty, we've applied that work, and we've operationalized it, uh, to Eleanor's point, um, across uh, a wider variety of uh, domains. And so we started with the provenance index, which is two million records about where um, and when uh, objects changed hands. We applied it to the museum collection, to conservation abstracts, to conservation science abstracts, uh, to publications in general. Uh, we have a photo study collection. We have enhanced archives, such as the Rouchet collection. Uh, we have reference samples in the conservation science department, and so on and so on and so on. So this phase was really the rapid expansion phase for the model. Of we have a core that we think is good. Okay, let's throw it, lots of stuff at it, and see what works and what doesn't. So my role uh, in this was semantics, so the model itself, and David uh, took on the software side of things. Uh, we have implemented it with a product called Arches, and it came originally from the Conservation uh, Institute, but is a linked open data platform um, with a focus on usability by editors, uh, by, the, by the input people who are working with it, as opposed to by technology. But uh, it's still very internally focused, so the next necessary phase is stabilization and um, uh, with the intent for increasing adoption. <coughs> um, so it's not that the Getty will be making a de facto standard, uh, it's that we want to instead work with everyone to have a community adopted standard that we can all agree on. Um, and with a community-oriented governance model, it's not that we want to control it, it's that we want to participate in it. Uh, there should be community input and engagement to make sure that the use cases are covered, and we want to validate it by applying further content within the, um, the scope of the work, and stabilize the model such that implementation, such as Sammy, um, Sammy's work uh, upcoming, can then be confident that they are building on a solid foundation 
rather than something that is going to be constantly shifting. So we're documenting all of this that, that's linked to cross art, cross art, um, which you can <coughs> peruse at your leisure. Link that then is a link open usable data for I'm glad we had the opportunity to write our own hashtag, so loud rather than blob. Uh, it's much easier to say. Um, it's collaborative with design, looks across institutions, uh, and so forth. It focus on, focuses on the you, on usability, rather than 100% precision and, and completeness. We aim to solve 90% of the use cases. You know, if we can get to 90%, that's better than the current 0%. Uh, but with only 10% of the complexity. And it's that last 10% where 90% of the complexity of the ontology lives. So if we can get to the sweet spot and then stop, uh, that would be great. So essentially, this is a, um, the diagram uh, of the way we think about it. So there is people at the back end who essentially throw money at the problem <coughs> and create triples. Those triples then go to a developer who needs to ferociously work with the data to produce an application that a researcher, be it a high school student or a, uh, or a university professor, can then um, interact with. So linked open data essentially optimizes for the person in the middle, because without the person in the middle, you can throw as much money at, at it as you want, but the end guy, the target audience, will never see that data. So uh, 2019 and, and 2020 is our area of formalization. Um, we have Press Foundation funding. Um, thank you, Max, um, uh, for, for that, uh, to um, engage with the wider community. So we do face-to-face -face meetings and um, bi-weekly calls. We'll try to modularize the work into areas uh, of interest um, to get to that, that level of confidence uh, in the 1.0. We've also expanded it uh, to not just be American art, uh, or not just American it's not American art or American art, um, but instead international uh, with a wide variety of organizations to ensure that we have that depth of uh, input <coughs> and experience from you know, the Rex Museum of the Louvre, uh, the Met, ourselves, Smithsonian, MoMA, um, uh, and uh, related organizations such as universities, um, societies, uh, the Canadian Heritage Information Network, and um, Europeana. So we hope that with this, Sort of core team um, of uh, engaged people, we can then ensure that this is going to be usable for the broadest possible audience. That is my time. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, after the, the um, talks, we'll be happy to take questions. So as Eleanor said, I'm Sammy Norling. I'm the Digital Collections Manager at New Fields, uh, where I work in the New Fields lab. And I will be talking today about what we hope will be our next steps. Um, we currently have an application in with the Mellon Foundation, and um, we're hoping to find out relatively soon if they will be funding AAC Phase 2, which we've started to call it. Um, and the primary goal of AAC Phase 2 is to establish linked data services for museums including the documentation that will be necessary so that museums can really start to take ownership of the linked data life cycle. So this is a, a, a phenomenal diagram, I love sharing these, um, that came out of the AC phase one. And this was the linked data pipeline that essentially powered um, the uh, entire collaborative. Um, we cannot take credit. These are the people who created um, all the pieces involved in here. Uh, and the pipeline really got all of the museums from step one which was getting their data out of their collection management systems, all the way to having a published linked open data with millions of triples uh, in one shared triple store. Uh, by the end of AAC phase one, a lot of the partners, as Eleanor mentioned, really didn't have a ton of involvement in this, this linked data life cycle, um, just out of necessity. The model was still a moving target very much so, uh, and. The, their main interaction with the Information Sciences Institute was in helping them to understand our business rules, which, as, as has been said, is not the best place to be when you're really trying to deal with your data, make sure it's represented accurately, correctly, um, and reflects all of your institutional priorities. So for better or worse, um, I actually came into AAC phase two at the very end and uh, kind of had a mess on our hands. Uh, the ISI students were struggling with modeling some of our data 
because it was messy, inconsistent, uh, and structurally complicated in some areas, which probably sounds familiar to a lot of you in this room. Um, so in order to mitigate those issues further on in the pipeline, I had to really start at the beginning and clean our data up. Um, and because ISI was taxed, there was a lot going on, we had to take on the remodeling work on our own. So um, it ended up being a really great thing because we became very, very familiar with this pipeline and the tools that are involved. And so partly because of that, and partly because of what the Newfields Lab is, we are now in this role where we're applying for Mellon funding and hoping to lead, uh, in many ways, part of this um, phase two of the AC. Um, just so you all know, the Newfields Lab, it is an in-house technology group at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields. Uh, and we create gallery interactives, we manage the website, uh, collections, portal, uh, and a number of other digital projects. But we're also in a unique position in that we are available to do outside contract work for other <coughs> cultural heritage institutions. And so our involvement in AAC phase one, our unfortunate and fortunate understanding of the pipeline um, that came out of that phase one, and the fact that we are structurally and within our organization able to support other institutions in digital projects. Um, it's like the perfect uh, recipe for us to be involved in this next step. So what will we be potentially doing if we get the funding from the Mellon Foundation? Um, key to this, and honestly what I'm seeing is our most important piece, is laying the foundation with the creation of very clear documentation of all the pieces of the pipeline, all of the tools that are involved, um, because really in theory, we want this to be something museums can completely take and run with and end up publishing linked data on their own. That's, that's really our end game. But that's not always what museums they want. They might just want to have somebody um, do this for them. They might not be able to do every single piece of the pipeline for themselves. So in cases where that's not possible, we will be providing services to support museums in completing the linked data life cycle. Um, I'm gonna go over some of those. There's kind of four key areas where we'll provide support. Um, and in a way, it'll be kind of a la carte if museums do need the support or don't. And it could be from consultation to completely carrying it out. But step one, of course, goes back to that getting the data out of your system. Um, and really that preparation work that needs to happen to get it ready for later on in the, uh, in the pipeline when you're modeling your data, um, which we missed out on at the beginning. Um, and not only getting that data out and cleaning it and then sending it on in the pipeline, but getting that data back into your CMS so that every subsequent time that you're triggering this uh, linked data publishing cycle, you're just starting with clean data where you need it to be. Um, related to this, the second step um, is also what I see as very much like a preparation piece is reconciliation with authorities. So part of getting your data ready should be taking the time to say, <laughs> This record that we have is the same as this record um, that this authority out there is um, describing in greater detail than we ever could. Um, like the Getty Union List of Artist Names, Art and Architecture Thesaurus, um, and other authorities being published as linked data online. So I, I do wanna take a minute to just say why take this step. Um, it really is the key to <coughs> undertaking linked data. If you're not going to reconcile with other authorities, in my opinion, you might as well not undertake publishing your data as linked data. Um, this diagram I use have used multiple times to demonstrate the value of reconciling with other sources. Um, in this case, yellow is like our data. And so we might have a record for Georgia O'Keeffe, and we have a record for William Merritt Chase, and we have works of art by both of those artists in our collection. We document as much as we can about those pieces and about those people, but it, it only makes sense for us to do so much cataloging but that's where Uland comes in, and they actually have documented the fact that George O'Keefe was a student of William Merritt Chase, which is nowhere in our data set. Um, but because we've taken the time to reconcile with both those authorities, once we publish our linked data on the web, people can now explore our collections in ways that our data did not make possible. Like, show me all of the works of art by students of William Merritt Chase, and now you see our works. Uh, and when you think that the linked data web out there includes general sources like Wikidata, which are broad and really specialized sources like the George O'Keefe Museum's data set, which are narrow but deep about these people, um, you can imagine all the different areas of exploration that publishing your data's linked data opens up. The real meat of uh, the services we'll be providing, I think, are the mapping surface services to the model, um, the linked art model that uh, will be developed. One way we'll be doing that is kind of a boutique way using the Karma data integration tool, which essentially you load in your data. It's like a spreadsheet. 
and you go through the process of transforming your data as needed, but really building this model on top that's mapping it to that linked art uh, model and creating that map that says, this column is a man-made object. Now you're, you're getting close to outputting the linked data that you need. But to simplify that process for museums that maybe don't want to undertake that boutique step, um, we do plan to develop a simple linked uh, art mapping tool. And essentially, that would be a web-based tool where if uh, you provide your data as a museum in this prescribed format, a CSV with these specific headings, this type of data in each column, you could upload your data and output linked open data. So whether you use Karma, whether you use the simple tool, you could end up with triples, you could end up with JSON-LD. Um, and then host that data, whether on your own or through services provided by us, either as raw data or in a triple store with a Sparkle endpoint. Um, and also uh, for AAC phase one and likely going forward, we'll be using Pubby to kind of put a nice uh, user interface on linked data so it's not just triples or JSON-LD when people are um, exploring your data. And um, I guess that's all I've got, but I, I will want to just um, emphasize the fact that we do imagine this as being a la carte. We do want to hear from other museums, not just necessarily the AAC partner museums as we're working through this process. Um, just like uh, uh, Rob said, is all the use cases that we can get just make the model and our processes and plans just that much more relevant for everybody. Hello. So um, yes, as, as it was mentioned before, um, the O'Keefe Museum wasn't part of the American Art Collaborative, but um, I, um, a couple of years ago, we, well, everyone knows Joseph O'Keefe, right? Okay, yeah, that's one of the things, now that I work there, never a problem. Um, so um, the one thing about our, our museum, as uh, Sammy mentioned, is that we're a single artist museum, and so we have um, that, you know, we not only have um, the artworks, but we also have um, archives, so like this letter, we Oops. have our personal, did I just? The mic went off all of a sudden. Hmm. I'm probably loud enough. Maybe. No, no, use the mic. No. Okay, well, how do I make it work? And maybe it's whatever back there again has to be. Who helped back there uh, set that up? <laughs> Who was it? <laughs> oh, he left, oh, he left. Oh, he left. Okay, all right. <laughs> it looks to me like the battery's dead. I was getting a battery. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so we have, uh, so we have our personal library. We have her, um, home, her historic homes. Um, we have artist supplies and everything. So we have this. We and a lot of this um, information about all these things or the connection between pieces were held in these different systems. And so uh, the problem that we had was that people who knew, like people who worked, like all this knowledge was in people, uh, different staff people. So one staff person might know, uh, might know that this letter is connected to this artwork or that this paint ship is this. So what we really want to do is kind of memorialize and actually make these connections so that it wasn't just stuck in people's heads. So um, we actually um, embarked on a grant, and this is an IMLS grant that has supported all of this. And interestingly enough, in 2015, when we wrote the grant, we, we started writing it and making it linked open data. And then we thought, oh, I don't think we can do this. Uh, I'm, I don't, you know, we're a smaller museum and we're not sure we can actually take on linked open data. And so when we wrote the grant, it wasn't for a linked data project. It was about bringing these systems together. But then by the time we got to the grant process and talked to some of these fine people here, because other people had done some things, we were able to feel like we could do it as well. So that's why we're here. Um, so uh, this is kind of the journey of ours. We have um, our library, uh, so her personal libraries are in a library system, which we actually just converted as well. We use Vernon for our collection management um, system, archive space for our archives, which is pretty common. And we have extensives for our, um, and our dam and our source uh, transcripts. So we wanted to pull all those together, and this is pretty much what we looked at for the original grant. But of course, the a big opportunity with linked <coughs> open data, as Sammy mentioned, is that most actually a lot of uh, O'Keeffe's famous paintings are not held by us, sadly enough. But uh, she was uh, actually very in control of um, that she wanted to put certain things at the Art Institute and certain things at the Met. So um, she has artworks all over the world, so it's part of her legacy. So, 
we can't just think about our own systems. So we have to add in that somehow we need to think about those because it's part about telling this deep, big story. Um, and then on top of that, so we, uh, so that kind of led us because we felt like we could do it by the time we got the grant and um, had this, uh, we could see what was happening out there. Link data, IIIF images, and the special part about what we're doing is that it's going deep, not broad, but it's all centered. So everything that we have, it um, somehow turns back to this wonderful woman. So, um, so basically, um, as, as we kind of uh, already talked about, we knew, or as I said, um, we felt like we could do linked data because we could learn from the American Art Collaborative and we worked with Design for Context um, who had worked with the American Art Collaborative and just really having good partners on the project. Um, so this is the, uh, my uh, good nerd slide. This actually is written from uh, Charlie at Design for Context. But really just, and I, can, I won't go through this, but this is kind of where we were going, but it's very much looks uh, like what you would see with American Art Collaborative as well. I just wanna say as far as like, as being a museum that wasn't part of the collaborative and how we were taking this on, is that um, you might've heard this before, but you know, for systems to collaborate, people need to collaborate. And as with many big uh, um, projects that you get into with data, <laughs> It was, it was just, it, it's all about how we work together because it did mean cleaning all the data. So um, working together with the registration department and how we actually um, deal with how we catalog and source things across the board from archives to library, from the collection management system to our personal property objects. So, th you know, this is always, I think, the hardest part in grants, but it's also the one that's I think is the most <coughs> capacity building for an organization. This is our patio at the um, or O'Keefe, so come visit us. Um, so uh, this grant, we um, initiated the grant, uh, I guess it was 18 months ago, and it was just completed uh, September 30th. And what we, um, we have a few things that uh, we, we did all of the um, modeling and um, got all of our processes in order. It is using all of the um, you know, mapping to um, external authorities and everything, but we also wanted to have, um, we wanted to get a beta browser so that we could actually start seeing for ourselves and testing this with, um, with uh, potential users. So this is just a, um, a view of this uh, browser that we have putting, um, coming together. This is again working with the Design for Context, who you'll hear from in a second. Um, so looking at also just pulling up our art things together, um, this is with the triple IF images, so we get the zoomables, so that we get, um, but one of the things that is what we're trying to also show, because of course this kind of looks like a collections website right now, and, and in a sense it just is, it's a collections website looking at our linked data, but we're trying to pull out the bits so we can really start testing how these can be uh, usable by researchers and by browsers and things like that. So looking at how, I think relationships is this key thing amongst our, first amongst our own data, and then once we start expanding out. So this is a showing a sketch and like a direct collection. So what was the what was the sketch of? What else happened that year? And this this is where the great opportunity is of us to get more data that 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 both um, explicit connections like this is directly connected to this, and then other things that are implicit into what happened <coughs> this year with the archives, with the art, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, arch um, archives and kind of a similar thing with filters and um, whether it has some of the, so really emphasizing the digital connections, but also go hearkening back to boxes and folders so that if people want to browse the shelf, as it were, and um, also just kind of um, also come in and use it. Um, another archive with her fabulous curly Q handwriting. Um, and maintaining some of this idea, if any of you work with our um, archives, that in archive space there's a, har um, a hierarchy. This is one of the tricky things with modeling, of course, is that the hierarchy is not a set level. So it can be kind of all over the place. So um, actually pulling this from the EAD, because also there's the other thing though, that archives have a very set standard across there. So, um, and re-representing that for the archival researcher that is used to kind of seeing that archive and being able to search, but then still having things like relationships and voice transcripts kind of thing. 
Thank you. Now I'll stop yelling. <laughs> um, but also just to show that artist belongings, and this is another thing in all working together and all trying to think about what we're willing to let out there. Um, my uh, registration department, they're just like, oh, we're so embarrassed, it has our handwritten, but it's access, right? And so this is something that there was not access to before. So we can always improve upon the, um, the photographs and things like this. So Mary Mako, which she really loved these um, outfits. So, and then the artist circle. So she had a lot of connections and kind of things like that. So this is just a way of kind of, um, that was a way of starting to get a beta browser together to start testing how this works out together. And it already, having access to that, even amongst our staff and everyone is, well, what if we did the data this way? What if we made sure these connections? So actually just seeing something and feeling it is also helping us evolve our cataloging practices according to standards. But another thing that we've been trying to do is also show that, of course, the browser is one way of looking at things. But also, um, so over the summer, I had interns look at uh, different pieces of our data and start experimenting with um, visualizations. So that we could start also getting our team or other people thinking about this as, as data. So how do we start you know, exploring different ways? And this is just a screenshot of one that, um, that they worked on where this was looking, each dot in this is an event. And um, O'Keefe was not a woman working alone in the desert. Uh, she had people out to the house in the desert. She had a lot of relationships. She traveled a ton. So, um, and some of these relationships were long over time. And, it came from thinking like, well, we're gonna make a graph of, this was a friend of, she was a colleague of, but you know, when someone's alive for this many years, you're a friend a couple of years, and then a couple of years you're not. And so we actually started looking at her relationship through events. So each dot is an event, and she had these events with people. So this one is with, with uh, um, uh, when she was reading Kandinsky and other people. And so a little blurb, but then these um, arches are all about a person. So what is her relationship over time? So thinking about doing different, um, having this in the gallery, testing it with people. We've had it out there. Uh, we showed it to the board. We, had, we took it into the gallery as an O'Keefe experiment. And just kind of like to see how people can explore data in a little different way. So um, basically that's where we are. We're really excited about how far we've come, especially how we work differently together and being able to see the data, but it's just the beginning. And um, so really thinking about now how we take that beta browser and really think about more, how do we make it so you're really getting at those interesting bits that that's, uh, goes above and beyond and really uses linked open data. Um, how do we make it so this is more generative, so that we capture every bit of information and link to it, so that it just becomes this, um, you know, just generates into something bigger and bigger, and uh, looking at doing pilot pro uh, projects with people on publishing research, so that we can just start testing how this can serve as a platform for other publishing, whether it's other people working on uh, projects, and of course connecting to um, other, other sources of information. Oh, that's so many ideas, yeah. Uh, Wikidata, blah, blah, blah. Um, but how do we really use this to start thinking about differently? So thank you. All right. Um, so I'm gonna step back a little bit and just reflect on a couple of the and some of the things that we've learned through these various projects and to think about what does that what are the things that we can take away and consider for how to approach this kind of a project uh, and these collaborations so the first theme is collaboration itself and uh, every six months uh, throughout the project the, all the partners would gather, usually uh, between one and three people from each institution. And so what comes out of that is a tremendous amount of brainstorming and visioning and also reassurance. And Liz even mentioned this in terms of uh, the O'Keefe getting started, that, that she and others, the whole team was reaching out to other members of the community, talking to people who'd done it before, um, in the project, both in the AAC and in other projects. Uh, they were talking very much internally in an 
active way that they hadn't before about how their, their, uh, their working practices would evolve. And what would happen in these meetings is people would come in with their data and say, well, okay, I've got this and I want to make sure that we convert this. Or I've got this really important thing over here and I want to make sure that that's there. Some folks would say, oh, I've got one of those too. And if we do that and can hook it up, and so it would spark a lot of additional ideas. So one of the other things that was coming out of the American Art Collaborative on a continual basis were ideas for other types of ways to use the data and manipulate the data and think about representing the data. And every one of the partners is still wanting to go further to do different kinds of things than they've done elsewhere. Things like curatorial notes, exhibition information, educational information, other types, types of interpretation, are all things that people have been talking about. So I urge you, whether you're going to be doing projects on your own or whether you're going to be participating with other institutions, to really think about how you have those conversations and give yourself permission to have space, to get together, to throw ideas against the wall because a lot of vision comes out of it and a lot of your ability to go back to your executive team and say, why the heck are we doing this? This is big, this is complicated, there's a lot of moving parts. Well, yeah, but look at this vision. Look at what we might be able to achieve. Another one is enhancement. So it was not a one and done. Again, as, as people would be working in the American Art Collaborative, they'd be putting data in, putting data together, working through the modeling, and you'd see something and say, that's not quite right. I mean, on the, the O'Keefe project, we were going up right up to the deadlines with, well, what if we just add this other connection between these two systems? What if we try and map it this way? Because that will give us a richer ability to describe what those relationships are and be able to use it in lots of different ways. What happens if we start instituting themes and thematic connections between works, between people? Uh, and so, this is an iterative process, and you have to actually give it permission for that thing to happen on a regular and iterative basis. Uh, and not be, not be feeling like, well, we've just gotten our data out, and it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be complicated to do it again, so we won't. I mean, it's part of the process that's being done here, part of what Sammy's uh, working, and Stuart and the folks at Newfields are doing, is to try and make those processes more routine, which makes it easier to say, well, let's just try this. Let's see how it, how it works. Let's see if it actually gives us added value and how we want to change that. So the enhancement process also works at the user interface level. We go through a lot of iterations in wireframing before coding. We go through a lot of code variations afterward to really try and see how to draw out this, uh, this type of information. Uh, adoption and extension, again, this is where the new field folks are coming out of the AAC and going to be proposing to the Mellon. Uh, that grant is not a sure thing yet. Any encouragement is greatly appreciated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot of good vibes between now and the spring. Really, come on, we're going to make this happen. Uh, but, but adoption, is, as Eleanor said at the beginning, the fact that there were so many institutions, 14 institutions, some of which just had one person working on one system and some which had whole IT teams. And so with that, the idea of what does it mean for us as an individual institution to take this step, to do this. Uh, also extensions, so uh, the one thing with the O'Keefe that extends it beyond what the American Art Collaborative does is the introduction of archives, library, dams information. We've talked actively with the conservator and the conservation team there about what it would mean to bring conservation data into this. Um, we did, uh, for those of you who are familiar with archives, there are a number of proposed types of models that are moving toward linked data, but there's nothing really solid there yet. And most archival models don't really come out of the museum community, and therefore the, the relationship between museums and archives in data terms is somewhat trickier. Uh, what, we did, uh, what we did with the O'Keefe as a first draft for the community was to begin to use the DAX 
framework and the DAX model as a target, but using a lot of the link art foundational principles that Rob and David and men, many members of the community have been working on in order to be able to create a pattern that can extend and stay consistent between, uh, between museum collections and archives and others. So these kinds of extensions are things that we're looking for. They're community engaging. The linked art group is going to really be a hub for a lot of those kinds of conversations. But I think we're going to see experimentation and new types of data coming from a lot of different places. Next steps, uh, you heard uh, Eleanor and Sammy both mention it. One of the things that, uh, that we're hoping to be involved in in the grant for the next round is uh, a set of micro grants. This is something that we're proposing to the Mellon to introduce, essentially make a part of this outreach into the community for probably six or seven fairly small grants for fairly small code elements. So uh, you'll notice here um, within the AAC site, there are these sort of bands that that, produce, that present different types of information. Uh, there are also experiments that were done. Um, uh, Charlie Butkowski at uh, Colby College had done an experiment where he drew the data out and said, what does it look like across these institutions to see how many works individual artists have? So you have the list of all the artists, and you have these uh, different patterns of how many works are held across. And so he was just experimenting with it and trying it out. And what we thought was, well, we should actually create a small spec for how you can do these as JavaScript-driven only uh, applets that we can plug into different sites and you can share and use them in different ways in different sites. And over time, begin to build a library of uh, what we call toys in the toy box. So create a toy box of linked data pieces, which means, again, the collaboration is you don't have to do it all yourself. You don't have to think of all the representations yourself. So I would encourage you, talk to us, talk to um, Rob and David. Uh, David's not here, but, uh, but is right regularly at other conferences and online as well, uh, about the kinds of things that, that might be of interest to you that could potentially even just sit inside your regular website. So it doesn't have to be linked data as an all or nothing. It might be one component that you use in a very particular way that draws on multi-institutions. So I'm going to summarize all that by saying, you know, I'm up on the eighth floor, which is the science fiction floor. And when I walk out the door of my room, I'm greeted by Yoda which is a wonderful way to spend a week, I have to say, and reminds me that we do or do not do. There is no try. <laughs> and so we've done it. And we hope that you will all join us in doing that. Just after that, we wish we had more time questions. for questions. We've got a few minutes for questions. So I'm not totally versed in all of this, but I wanted to ask how this relates to Semantic Web. I saw that you the published. That one. <laughs> <laughs> the semantic Architect is going to answer that question. And, and I'm just wondering, like, again, I'm out here, I work for Alley, we build a lot of websites, and there's a lot of structured data that we lay into websites that can be read easily. And it seems like with JSON, you can publish it. Would it be beneficial to start publishing each piece of data as its own? JSON with Puppy so that it gets digested by other services and then driven traffic by Google and things like that. And one other thing is on the interactive, have you thought about building a Jupyter Notebook plugin so people can do visualizations? <laughs> uh, and that community seems to have a bunch of money, so that might be an interesting thing. So um, the semantic web, uh, I always say, is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it never really became reality. Um, and today we've seen that um, while uh, Sir Tim's vision um, of a, a connected data web um, is, is becoming reality, it's not the, the exact same way that he envisioned it 20 some years ago. 
uh, it's really coming as a developer-friendly data um, being embedded within web pages um, as JSON-LD, which I, board transparency, I am the co-chair of the JSON-LD working group in the W3C, so <laughs> uh, I am preaching my own um, stuff here a little bit. Uh, but schema.org um, as one ontology uh, is suited for um, search engine optimization, driving traffic to your site, and it is linked data, it is linked open usable data. Um, so uh, one of the things that we want to do as part of the linked artwork is not only produce the formal um, application profile for site CRM, but also say, and here is the automated transform from the rich museum focused description language back to the sort of more SEO level of schema.org that you can simply embed whole cloth in your website and it will drive um, the Google crawlers uh, to you to increase your traffic, to increase your visitors, to increase your resources, to increase your ability to maintain your data. So it's uh, a virtuous cycle. And for people that have already worked on putting their collections online, do you see this as a way that that data could then be driven onto objects that already have web pages and use yeah. them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Paula. Paula Gangtaye from IMLS. We can both do. Yeah. You want to take it first? Whichever way we want to do it. <laughs> sure. Um, we did a lot of uh, upfront user research with the partners in AAC. Um, we have not done any formal usability studies, but we have been gathering some feedback from some of the institutions, but it's informal feedback. We have put together a, uh, a format that they can use to do their own internal usability tests. Um, uh, we haven't really followed up on how much they're doing that, and of course that's sort of a volunteer activity now for the, the partners and the institutions, but we're very interested in doing more of that and making that a continual part of the process. We've also been I would really encourage about that. you all to look at that aspect because this initiative has been around for a couple of years, So, uh, December is not too far off, maybe not this year, but again, that's that's our uh, sort of way of uh, encouraging the sector uh, to think about this, you know, as you're beginning, not as an afterthought, but sort of building it in and, uh, you know, thinking about it. Because again, for funders, what's the most important thing for us is what's the impact for whom you are creating. And I'm so glad you bring that because it's a, a, something very that I'm very passionate about. And I think that these projects, there's so much work to do on the back end that we end up spending so much time there. And, and so, um, which it does not go to waste. That back end infrastructure needs to happen, but it's definitely something that we've been talking about because there have not been a lot of um, like flipping it around and looking at from the user aspect of what does a researcher need and how does this really how does this really fit the promise um, of being something usable? So we are hoping, we've got a, uh, we're waiting on a grant from, um, you know, we applied for a grant from NEH that we'll, to find out any time now that is specifically about user experience with linked open data. And, um, and at that point, we, if we get that, we will bring together a symposium and we will do user experience studies. So everyone can press their, but, but even if we don't get the grant, it is something that we, that's why we want beta interfaces and to test things so that we get them in front of people and we actually do real studies because what does a research want, researcher want from linked open data? And at what level of tech complexity do they, um, d does it have to um, not be um, for them to get to that? Um, how does this really be treated as data 
that a curator that doesn't know how to do a sparkle query. So I think that, yeah, and I, th I think that we need to start showing these the promise that is really behind all this in a way that normal everyday museum people can use. Um, so it's really important. So, I'm, and I'm excited to hear about that new grant. Can I just add one, I realize we're slightly over time, but I just wanna add one point to that which is that within the community and within linked data, because there hasn't been a standard model and because there's a really heavy lift to get things out there, uh, traditionally what we're seeing is institutions who are taking data from one data set and pushing it out as linked data. So all they've really done is a data transformation. Uh, what the AAC has been trying to do and the O'Keeffe's been trying to do is create these cross relationships across the data sets. But most of the data we have right now is coming out of legacy systems that don't do that. And so really the applications that have been built so far are mostly just collection display systems without the power of a lot of additional linking, which is where the real strength is going to come. So I think we're at the point now where we can begin to start doing studies on something more than just what looks like everybody else's collection system. We can, we're out of time, but we're here to have follow-on conversations and continue, and I think all of us are here for the rest of the week.